F equals MA. Or as I prefer, A equals F over M. I mean, really, there's something to be said for F equals DP, DT, but let's not go there. A equals F over M because the acceleration results from the force. F equals MA suggests that the force results from the acceleration. Mathematically, they're identical, but uh, this, to me, slightly suggests more what really goes on. So that's what we're doing today. And we'll start with problem one. A soccer ball is falling straight down. So here's what I'm going to do. I don't define axes in the problem, so I'll define myself x and y like that. And I'll draw the soccer ball, and there, v. That's its velocity. It's falling straight down. At one instant in time, it's falling with a speed of 15 meters per second. Two seconds later, it's falling with a speed of 25 meters per second. What is the net force on the soccer ball? Well, I'm not going to draw a free body diagram. I'm just going to say, well, we know it's going down, and we know it's speeding up in the down direction, so we know F net has to be down because it was falling with 15 meters per second. Later, it's falling with 25 meters per second. It's speeding up in the downwards direction. That means acceleration is down. That means force net has to be down. And of course, F net is equal to MA. Um, I didn't give you the mass of the soccer ball, but let's say it's, um, I can look it up. Okay, 0.43 kilograms. Um, I will put that in the problems before I post them. So it's 0.43 kilograms, so we actually have enough to figure this out. We know what A is. A is delta V over delta T. Now there is the question. This is the definition of A, but it's only defined for very short time intervals delta T. Is two seconds a short time interval? I don't know. So what we're going to do is go ahead and assume that it is, and what we'll be really calculating is the average acceleration during this time. And then if it doesn't change very much, it will be the same as the average acceleration. So we can calculate that. Um, what we have is Vf is equal to, and I'm going to go ahead and put a vector on this, is minus 25 meters per second y hat, right? This indicates it's in the y direction, and then minus indicates it's down, and Vi is equal to minus 15 meters per second y hat, and delta t is 2 seconds. So I can do this. Vf is minus 25 meters per second y hat minus, minus, so it becomes a plus because minus, minus, 15 meters per second y hat divided by 2 seconds. I can factor out the y hat, so I'll have minus 25 plus 15 meters per second y hat divided by 2 seconds, minus 25 plus 15. I hope you don't need your calculator for that. That's minus 10 over 2 meters per second squared. I've factored the units out here, y or minus 5 meters per second squared y hat. That is the acceleration of the ball, which isn't what we were asking for. We were asking for the net force. So that's now pretty easy. It's 0.43 kilograms times uh, minus 5 meters per second squared y hat. Now, don't get confused here. Don't think, oh, the acceleration is minus 5 meters per second squared. It's not. The magnitude of the acceleration is 5 plus 5 meters per second squared. The y hat is a vector. So this is now a vector here. Because remember, if you multiply a vector by a scalar, you get a vector. This minus is here is because the direction is the minus 5 or sorry, the direction is the minus y direction. That's why I have that minus there. So I'm calculating the full vector here. If I was calculating the magnitude of the force, I would just multiply 0.43 kilograms by 5 meters per second squared. But I am calculating the full vector. Let's see, can I do this in my head? So 5 times 0.4 is 2, and 0.03 times 5 is 0.15. I think this is equal to minus 2.15 newtons, because kilogram meters per second squared is newtons. Um, and in the y hat direction. So that is the net force on the soccer ball. All right, part two, what is the magnitude of air resistance on the soccer ball? Aha, uh -huh. now notice this is magnitude, okay. What I'm gonna do here is the first thing you should always do when thinking about different forces. All right, this wasn't a free body force diagram, this is. We have FG on the soccer ball. And we have FD, which I'll call for drag, or the air resistance. Those are the only two forces acting on the soccer ball. 
I mean, I didn't tell you there are no other forces, but if a soccer ball is falling, um, you can assume gravity, you can assume air resistance, unless you're assuming there's no air resistance, but I didn't tell you not to, and you know that it's there. Plus, you notice that it's falling at a rate slower than gravity, so there's got to be something other than gravity on here. What could it be? Well, air resistance is the most natural thing. We also know that F net, and I'm going to undo this box here, because F net has to equal, well, it has to equal FD plus FG, right? Because the net force is the vector sum of all the forces on it. So that's equal to FD minus MGY hat, right? So the force of gravity has magnitude MG. It's in the minus Y hat direction. Okay, well, so I have, notice that F net is entirely in the y hat direction. Gravity is entirely in the y hat direction. What I'm going to do is take this equation, which is a full vector equation, and just pull out the y component of it, because nothing interesting is happening in x or z. And so I say F net y, the y component, is equal to F d y, the y component of drag, minus m g, which is the y component of gravity. Or, now you can see that F d y has to equal F net Y plus MG. And now we know what we, we know enough to plug numbers in. So F net, that should have been F net Y, is minus 2.15 Newtons plus 0.43 kilograms times 9.8, running out of space, meters per second squared. I can't do that in my head, so I'm going to whip out my calculator. 0.43 times 9.8, and that's the plus, and I subtract 2.15 from that, and I get 2.064 equals 2.064 newtons. That is the y component, and notice the y component is positive, so air, for, air resistance is pointing up. What we care about is the magnitude. Well, since the x and z components are zero, it's the same as the absolute value of the y component, so it's just 2.06 newtons. That is the magnitude of air resistance acting on this. We figured that out because we knew um, that gravity is acting on it. We know what gravity is going to be. We were given the acceleration sort of indirectly of the ball so we could figure out the net force. Well, the only two forces are drag and gravity, so if I take gravity away, or I, I consider the effect of gravity, drag must be whatever is left over to give you the proper net force. So there. That is problem one. Second problem, two masses, M1 and M2, hang from an ideal cord. The ideal cord runs over an ideal pulley, which is affixed in place. The cord moves without slipping along the pulley. What is the acceleration of each box? So here's our ideal pulley. It's nailed to the wall, can rotate freely. We have two masses, M1 and M2, and M2 is bigger than M1. What is the acceleration of each box? Well, okay. I'm going to start by dropping my pen. I'm going to start by defining x and y because I say what is the acceleration. I didn't say what is the magnitude of acceleration. That means I have to give a direction. In this case, up and down are probably the way to do it, but I'll go ahead and define y so that I've got that next. I'm going to use my intuition. We just know if this is heavier than this, it's going to be accelerating this way. So a2 is going to be that way. a1 is going to be this way. Finally, because this is an ideal string, it's an inextensible string, that means how are, it's taught because there's stuff hanging on it. However much this moves down, this has to move up the same amount. That means also if it, the rate at which this is moving down has to be the same as the rate at which that one's moving up. So the speeds of the two have to be the same, and then the velocities are going to be opposite because one's going down. And the rate of change of the speed has to be the same, so the accelerations are going to be the same. So we know from the beginning that the magnitude of A2 has to equal the magnitude of A1. And just from looking at the directions, we know that A2 is going to be minus A1. Okay, we just know that because it's an inextensible string. Now next, but what is the acceleration? Well, what do we have to work with? We have gravity to work with, and we have F equals MA to work with, so let's work with them. And what's the first thing you do when working with F equals MA? You draw a free body diagram. So here is box number one. I'll label it number one. Number one. And then you have FG1 acting that way on it. 
and FT1 acting that way on it. And then here is box number two. I have F G2 acting on it and FT2 acting on it. Those are the only forces acting on these two boxes. We're going to ignore air resistance, which probably is ignorable in this case. Um, good. And two different free body force diagrams. Now here's the other thing we know. Because it's the same string and it's an ideal string, and as long as it's not affixed anywhere here, as long as there's not something that could cause the tension to be different on two sides. If you think about a real string, which is an approximation, I don't have one in front of me, but imagine I had a real string. Um, you could like stretch this part of it. I really wish I had a real string. Wait, I'm going to find one. All right, here's my real string. So I could stretch this part of it, and you see that there's tension here, but because I'm actually holding this, it doesn't, it's, I don't have an ideal pulley here, but I actually have something that keeps it from going anywhere. There's no tension here, but there is doing tension there. So it is possible to have tension changes in an ideal string, but for that to happen, you have to have a point along the string somewhere that is sort of affixing it in place and that is exerting a force on the string along the string. That's not what the pulley is doing. The pulley is just letting the string change direction because it's an ideal pulley. It's not sliding along it, and there's no um, friction in the pulley allowing tension changes. So the tension is going to be the same everywhere along the um, string. Because of that, we know that the magnitude of FT1 has to equal the magnitude of FT2. And in fact, we can go a step further in this case. This won't in general be true. But notice in this case, both of them are in the plus y direction. So in this case, we know that FT1 equals FT2. That won't in general be true. If the strings are off at different angles, the vectors won't be the same, but the magnitudes will be. That's what it means when we say the tension is the same everywhere along the string. All right, and so now at this point, we have everything we need. So I'm going to start by doing F equals MA. Let's do it for the left side guy. We know that um, the net force on the left side guy, which is going to be FT1 plus FG1, is going to equal M1A1. Well, okay, what I'm going to do is let's just talk about the Y component. And we know that the Y component, in fact, I'm going to define a variable FT here, which is the magnitude of the tension. We know that the tension is all in the plus Y direction, so the Y component of FT1 is just FT. We know that the Y component of MG is, or of FG1 is minus MG because it's pointing down, so the Y component has to equal M1, and I'm just going to put in A1, the magnitude of acceleration, uh, because we know that A1, or at least we have defined A1 to be in the positive Y direction. Were I to calculate a negative A1, that means I would say, oh, what that means is when I drew it, I drew it in the wrong direction. But as it is, I have defined A1 to be in the positive Y direction. I have defined A2, well, all right. I'll just say it like this for now, and when I get to A2, I'll clarify what I was talking about. Well, that's good. I want A1. This should have been M1G. Unfortunately, I don't know FT. So I'm going to have to do more algebra, but I'm not done setting things up either, because I can talk about the second mass. I know that FT2 plus FG2 has to equal M2A2. Well, that's very excellent. And so now here's the thing, is I know that the y component of a2 is negative a2 because I've drawn this arrow this way. And again, if I, if I calculated an actual negative value for that, that would tell me I drew the arrow in the wrong direction. That's what I was saying earlier. The magnitude of ft2 is just ft. Also, the y component is ft because it's up. Minus m2g is equal to minus m2a2. And then finally, we know the magnitudes of these two things are the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually just say it's M1A and minus M2A. Say that A is the magnitudes of these accelerations. So I know that the first one, the acceleration's in the plus Y direction. The second one, the acceleration's in the minus Y direction. That's why this has a minus on it. So this is the Y component of F equals MA. That's the Y component of F equals MA. So I can take these two equations. I know M1. I know G. I know M2, but I don't know FT, I don't know A. I have two equations, two unknowns, I can solve for them. Turns out in this problem, I don't even ask you for FT. So let's get rid of FT. I'm going to take this one, and FT is equal to M1A plus M1G. I've added M1G to both sides. And now I will substitute for FT over here. I get M1A 
plus M1G minus M2G is equal to minus M2A. That's pretty exciting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add M2 to both sides and subtract all of this from both sides so that I have M1 plus, I don't want to do two steps at once. I mean, I do, but I won't. M1A plus M2A is equal to, I have to subtract both things from both sides. So I have M2G minus M1G. You have to be very careful not to do signs wrong. Now I can factor the A out, and I have M1 plus M2 a is equal to M2 minus M1G. Remember, M2 is bigger than M1. We're told that, so this is a positive number here. Or, I'm going to go ahead and write the answer over here. A is equal to M2 minus M1 divided by M2 plus M1 times G. That's the acceleration. To really finish the problem, I would have to say that A2 vector is equal to, right, so it's down as defined, and I didn't get a negative on this, so I'm good, is equal to minus M2 minus M1 over M2 plus M1 G Y hat. So I've put in the Y hat, the unit vector in the Y direction. This now says it's down, and A1 is equal to plus M2 minus M1 divided by M2 plus M1 G, Y hat, and now that's actually the answer to the question that was asked, which is what's the acceleration of the two blocks? So there you go, that is problem two. Problem three, a flatbed truck starts at rest with a crate sitting on its flatbed. So here's the truck, and here's the crate. Got the, it's got the uh, Lost Ark of the Covenant in it. The truck has a driver. He's got a hat. has a wheel. All right. Okay, that's enough. Um, it starts at rest. The truck starts to accelerate, but the driver is really stepping on the gas and has added a turbocharger to the truck, so the truck accelerates at a rate of 0.4 G. That's pretty good for a truck. If you've ever followed a big old truck at the stoplight, you know that, oh my goodness, they take forever to accelerate. So it's accelerating that way, and the acceleration is 0.4 g. Notice I didn't put a vector sign on here. I've drawn that as in the plus x direction. Everything's in the x direction in this problem. OK, so that's a big acceleration. Passersby watch in shock. So the passersby have, uh, there's actually a downed electrical line there, and they've all picked it up, and it's raining, and they're standing barefoot, and they're receiving electric shocks. That's what that means, passersby watch in shock. Okay. Hey, draw a free body diagram for the crate. Here is the crate. Free body diagram. What forces are acting on it? Gravity is acting on the crate. Next, um, normal force between the bed of the truck and the crate is acting. Anything else? Probably not air resistance. The truck is starting at rest, and if there's no wind, there won't be any drag from air. But here's the thing, if you think about it, when a truck starts to go, the crate normally, ideally, will go with the truck. Why does it go with the truck? Well, if a crate starts at rest here, and then starts moving that way, that means it's accelerating that way. That means there must be some force to the right to get the crate accelerating to the right. What is that force? Well, there's only one force. This crate isn't, it's just resting there. It's not chained down, so there's no straps holding it into place. About the only force we have is just friction between the truck and the crate. That's the thing, right? That's what happens when you, when you have something resting on something else, and if it moves forward and it drags it with it, it's friction dragging it with it. So that's our free body force diagram. And in fact, B, the crate will also accelerate forward. What is the force causing this acceleration? That, I basically had to answer B to do part A here. So friction is the force. Next, there is a bit of oil on the bed of the truck. So let's light it on fire. Sorry, lost control of myself. There's a bit of oil on the bed of the truck. So the sliding friction force between crate and truck can only get as large as 0.2 times the normal force of the truck bed on the crate. Except I spelled it create couple times, so i got to fix those before I post it. Good. What that says is that the magnitude of the friction force um, is only going to be 0.2 
times the magnitude of the normal force, because Fn is in fact the normal force between the bed and the crate. Those of you who have done physics before know that what I'm doing is, even though I haven't talked about this in class yet, I'm sort of slipping in coefficients of kinetic friction. But don't worry about that, we'll get to that later. So given that, describe the motion of the crate. Describe the motion. It goes to the right. All right, we can do a little better than that. Let's go ahead and do F equals MA on this. First of all, it's sitting on the bed of the truck. It's not going to move in the Y direction. I'll define X and Y here. So we know that F, well here, let's put it this way, AY of the crate has to equal zero. And that tells us that, and I'll go ahead and put in the mass of the crate. If AY is zero, MIY is also zero. That tells us that the magnitude of the normal force because the normal force is all in the y direction, so the y component of the normal force is the same as its magnitude, minus the y component of gravity, well, gravity is all in the y direction, minus mg, or we know from thinking about F equals ma in the y direction that the normal force is equal to mg. Okay, let's think about the x direction. Max, ax, is going to equal the friction force magnitude, and that's it, because that's the only force in that direction. And we know that the friction force magnitude is equal to 0.2 times the normal force. And we know the normal force is equal to mg, so it's 0.2 mg. So we know that the x, the acceleration of the crate, which is entirely in the x direction, so the x component acceleration of the crate is 0.2 mg. I can divide both sides by m. I get the x acceleration of the crate is 0.2 g. Now this is interesting. Because notice the truck is accelerating at 0.4 g. The crate is accelerating less than that. So what will happen is as the truck accelerates forward, the crate will kind of slide off the back of the truck. So if you try to plot the motion of this, so sometime later the truck will be here, the crate, I've got to draw it farther. I'm going to draw, I'll draw smaller pictures here. Here's what happens is you start with the, you start with the truck here, in the crate, and then sometime later the truck is now here, the truck's bed, has, the truck's cab has become triangular, and the crate's there, so that, let's start with the crate close to the front here so you can see what's going on. You see the crate slid to the back sometime later, the truck is here, and now the crate has actually fallen off and become misshapen. Right, so as the truck goes forward, the crate also goes forward, but not as fast as the truck, because the truck is accelerating at 0.4 g, the crate's only accelerating at 0.2 g, so the crate does not keep up with the truck. So from the point of view of the truck, the crate slides off the back. It is still moving forward, right? The crate has moved forward by the time it slides off the truck, so it doesn't shoot backwards, even though the driver of the truck probably sees that, because it is moving backwards relative to the truck. But it's not accelerating as fast as the truck, so it falls off. What is the force accelerating? Friction. Now you might say, wait a minute, you told us that friction is always opposite the direction of the motion. And yet here, the crate is moving forward and friction is forward, how can that be? Well, okay, sliding friction is always opposite the direction of relative motion of the two things that are sliding against each other. So if you look at it, if you zoom in, here's the bed of the truck moving that way. Here's the crate moving that way slower the relative motion of the crate relative to the bed of the truck is backwards because it's not going forward as fast as the bed of the truck is. So friction will in fact act that way because it's opposite the direction of relative motion. So yes, friction, sliding friction acts opposite the direction of relative motion of the two things sliding against each other, which if you have more than one thing moving might be different for what you think is the motion, which would be really relative to the earth here. So that is this problem with the crate sliding along the truck. The crate will accelerate to the right at point 2G, which is less than the truck is accelerating. So that means the truck, I mean, we say the crate falls off the back of the truck, but really what it is is the truck sort of moves out from underneath the crate and the friction isn't enough to keep the crate up and the crate slides off the back. The same kind of thing will happen if you put your coffee on top of your car and you drive away. Do not recommend. Uh, there's a physics blogger, Chad Orzel, who accidentally left his phone on the top of his car, got home and it was still there. Hey, hooray friction. Sometimes friction's good enough for you. Um, I should probably point you to that blog because it's probably all relevant. I'll do that when we get to the friction chapter. This is problem three.
Last problem. Spider-Man, M equals 75 kilograms, is hanging in the alley between two tall buildings. And he says, I do not like where I am. It's time for another reboot. All right, so here are your two tall buildings. Here is Spider-Man, except Spider-Man has his arms up. And then he has webbing, strands of webbing attached to the top corners there. He is exactly between the two buildings, and the distance from his hand to the wall is two meters. But I don't like that, so I'm going to call that, what do I want to call that? W for width. So that is the distance from his hand to the wall, and if he's exactly in between, that says that is also W. He's preventing himself from falling freely by holding in two strands of webbing material that he's attached to the corners of the building. He's a distance H below the ed edge of the building as drawn. So this here is H. It's drawn from the tip of his hand is where H is. So that's H. This is also H. A. If H equals 4.5 meters, what is the angle that the web strands make with respect to the, will to the building? Well, okay. The angle that the web strands make with respect to the building is that, theta. It's going to be the same angle because these are similar triangles. Right? And just looking at it, well, that's theta. I know that tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So tangent theta is W over H. So from that, I can figure out what theta is. So if I plug in W, what do I say? 2.0 meters divided by 4.5 meters. I get that tan theta is equal to calculator. I get that tan theta is equal to 0 0.4444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444444
because FT2 clearly is pointing more in the minus x direction. Um, well, that's not very exciting because this just tells us that zero is equal to zero. So, okay, we're good. Um, that was not very exciting at all. In fact, given that these theta's are the same, I didn't even have to tell you the web strands were identical. You could have used this to figure out that you have to have the same FT on both sides because otherwise this wouldn't have come out to zero. Very exciting. Let's do the Y component, which is the more interesting one. This M A Y, that's also equal to zero. Well, you have a component F T one Y plus F T two Y plus F G Y. F T one Y is just F T cosine theta. F T two Y is F T cosine theta. Except the cosine theta is not in the subscript. And FGY is minus MG. The magnitude is MG, but it points in the minus Y direction. So the Y component of gravity is minus MG. That has to equal zero. If I add MG to both sides, I get MG equals two FT cosine theta. Or, and what is it I'm after? I'm after what is the tension in the web material? I'm after FT. So FT is equal to MG over two cosine theta. And if I substitute in for cosine theta here, it's mg times the square root of h squared plus... Now you're saying, why don't you just plug in 24 degrees? Yeah, I could. That'd be okay. But I'm being anal here and going back to the original, divided by 2h, right? So h over root h squared plus w squared, that was cosine theta I plugged in. And if I put in numbers... So Spider-Man's mass, Spider mass is 75 kilograms. 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 g is 9.8 meters per second squared. We have the square root of h squared plus w squared. h is 4.5 meters squared plus w is 2 meters squared. That's under the square root. All divided by 2h, which is 2 times 4.5 meters. Okay, so do that calculation and you get 402.2 newtons. 02.2 newtons. How many sig figs do we have? We have two here, two here. Yeah, we're gonna have two sig figs. Um, notice this two is not limited to one sig fig because we know perfectly that there are two strings. So that is not, I mean, it's not like, oh, there maybe is 1.9 strings or 2.1 strings, none of that. This is a perfect number. So we have two sig figs. So I could say that the tension in one of these is 400 newtons, or if I want to be really clear that I have two sig figs, I could write 4.0 times 10 to the 2 newtons. All right, that's the tension in one of these strings. Now, is that a lot? Sure! What we have to do is, um, to know if it's a lot, we don't have much intuition, so we're going to have to do a, a unit conversion here. So what I'll do is uh, convert, okay, there are 0.2248 pounds in a newton. So if I take this 400, I'm actually going to take 402.2 extra digits for intermediate numbers, and I multiply it by 0.2248, and I get that's about 90 pounds. So each one of these two uh, cables has 90 power cables, web strands, has 90 pounds of tension in it. Okay, that's part C. <clears throat> in part D, it turns out that the web material is stretchy. I probably knew that. Um, if we assume it has a maximum tension of 380 newtons, what is Spider-Man's acceleration? So you see here, it needs to be 400 newtons to hold him at rest. It can't get that high. He would this so that you cannot get enough tension. He will actually accelerate that way. There will be a net force on him. So, in order to figure that out, we're going to keep it at this angle for now because we're asking this acceleration here. We're going to erase. In fact, some of this will get redone shortly, but I'll erase a bunch of that. We'll do the same thing. I'm just going to consider the y direction again. But now the y acceleration is no longer going to be equal to zero. It's what we want. And m times a y is going to equal, well, the, the sum of, I'll go ahead and write it out explicitly, ft1y plus ft2y plus fgy, right? It's the y component of the sum of the net forces. And we know that FT1y is FT cosine theta. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and put in two FT cosine theta. 
because FT one y and FT two y are both FT cosine theta, so we have two of them minus mg. A y is what we're after, so I'm going to divide both sides by m. We get two FT cosine theta over m minus g. I divided the whole side. In fact, why don't I do this? Because this is an algebra error I've seen some of you make. Minus mg. I have to divide the whole thing by mg. But then if I have two things subtracted over this, that is the same as making it two fractions like this, right? It's sort of going backwards from common denominator. And now the m's cancel just over here. I can't cancel the m over here because it doesn't work. And now I can put it in. In this case, I am told that it's 380 newtons, but I'm going to put in kilogram meters per second squared because that's what a newton is, times cosine theta. So I'm going to put in another h over the square root of w squared plus h squared, all divided by m, which is 75 kilograms. And the reason I did that is I'm sort of only half plugging in numbers here. For cosine theta, why don't I put in the h over the square root of w squared plus h squared. So h is 4.5 meters divided by the square root of 4.5 meters squared plus 2 meters squared. There, now I'm plugging in all these numbers. Again, I have meters over meters squared under the square root. That's meters. So those meters cancel. This kilogram cancels this kilogram. I'll be left with meters per second squared minus 9.8 meters per second squared, right? That's what a y is. So I can put all of these numbers into my calculator. And the result I get is equal to minus 0.54 meters per second squared. Let's think about sig figs. This, just the left side here is going to be good to two sig figs. So if I had calculated it out, I would have come up with something like uh, 9.3 something. This is good to two sig figs, but notice this is only good to the tenths place. So really, I only have one sig fig in my answer here. So I have his acceleration, and we know it's in the y direction. I'll write it like this. Is minus 0.5. Oh, I left the units off. I am a terrible person. Meters per second squared in the y hat direction. It came out negative because this was a little bit less. That's what we expected, right? Gravity's pulling him down. The, the tension can't quite hold him up, so he's still accelerating, not very much, but a little bit, half a meter per second squared, downwards, as, as he hangs between this and his, his web strings. He's like, uh-oh, my web strings aren't strong enough, and he's still sliding down. And then the last question is, with this maximum tension, how far below the top of building, i.e. what value of h, must he be for him to hang at rest? So what we're going to do now is h is no longer... 4.5 meters, so theta is no longer that. It's still the same um, free body force diagram. It's still this, but now we want him to hang at rest. Okay, so we want the acceleration to be zero, meaning if he's at rest and he stays at rest, there's no acceleration. What I'm after is h, so I'm going to plug in now ft cosine theta is h over the square root of w squared plus h squared. And you're all stressed now because there's an h here and under the square root. But it's okay. We can deal with this. That's equal to mg. I'm going to add mg to both sides. I'm going to divide both sides by 2. And I'm going to multiply, or sorry, divide both sides by 2ft. All right, that's equal to h over the square root of w squared plus h squared. And then finally, I'm going to multiply both sides by this square root. Do I want to? No, I don't want to. I'm going to square both sides first. So I'm going to get m squared g squared over 4 ft squared is equal to h squared over w squared plus h squared, right? I squared both sides, so all these got squared, this got squared here, that just got rid of the square root. Now I'm going to multiply, I'm going to move my algebra over to here, I'm going to multiply both sides by w squared plus h squared, so I have w squared plus h squared times m squared g squared over 2ft squared has to equal h squared. I'm after solving for h squared, so what I'm left with is m squared g squared w squared. I am distributing this back that way, divided by 2ft squared, and I will also have a plus mg squared, m squared g squared h squared over 2ft squared. I'm going to subtract that from both sides. That's a 2. 
Now I'm going to factor out my h squared, so it's h squared times 1 minus m squared g squared over 2ft squared. All right, and now I've got what I need. Um, having run out of space horribly, I'm going to do a, I'm just going to erase this. I don't need that anymore. Um, board management fail big time. So now I'm going to go up to here. I can solve this for h. I get h squared is equal to the left side divided by the right side. So this is going to be ugly. Just prepare yourself. m squared g squared w squared divided by 2ft squared all over 1 minus m squared g squared over 2ft squared. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom. I'll leave myself more space here. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by 2ft squared, so I'll get m squared g squared w squared over 2ft squared minus m squared g squared, and that's actually nicer. I'm going to multiply the top and bottom so that canceled this, but then this had to pull in that. And now I can plug in the numbers. I'm going to erase the free body diagram. Mourn the free body diagram. It is gone. Erase the earlier algebra. And in fact, the other thing I can do is take a square root of this whole thing. So I have h is equal to the square root is equal to mgw, that's the square root of the top, divided by the square root of 2ft squared minus m squared g squared. That's what h has to be, so that's 75 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 2.0 meters divided by 2 times 380 kilogram meters per second squared, squared. Was that 2ft squared? Have I done something horribly wrong? I think that should have been 4ft squared. This should have been a 4 here, because when I squared that 2ft, I should have gotten 4ft squared. So all along here, this should have been 4. I apologize for that. So that should have been 4. 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 And that should have been 4. So 4, 4, 4. What I'm doing right now is very hazardous of, of going and trying to fix the algebra in place. Usually if you've made an algebra mistake like that, it's easier to just actually just wipe it and go back and redo. It's less hazardous. But I think I did it right. I'll check later. Minus m squared g squared, so 75 kilograms squared times 9.8 meters per second squared. That is all under a square root. Now I have enough that I can plug the numbers in to my calculator, so I shall do so. Okay. And when I plug that into my calculator, I'll get that h is equal to 7.60 meters. Now to figure out how many sig figs I have, I would actually have to do just this denominator all by itself, because there's a subtraction here to make sure the number of sig figs I have in that. I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'll just guess that I probably have two sig figs, and I'll say that 7.6 meters. So if he's four meters below, he goes, oh, no, 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 no. But what happens is as he gets further down, this thing gets more vertical, and so eventually this 380 newtons, enough of it is pointing up that it can offset his gravity, and when he's at this height, he will able to, he will be able to hang at rest there if he wants to. All right, that's your F equals MA problems. That is it for this week. Thank you.